welcome to this Five Leaves Bookshop online event with two excellent local poets, uh, Maria Taylor and Joe Dixon, both of whom have new collections out at the moment. Um, I'm Pippa Hennessy from Five Leaves Bookshop and I'm your host for the event. Uh, before we get stuck into the poetry, there's a bit of housekeeping I need to go through. So first of all, this is the running order. Once I've stopped blethering on, Joe will read first, followed by Maria. Then we'll have a short Q&A session at the end where both poets will answer any questions that you might have for them. Um, the whole event should last for around 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, if you've got any questions you want to ask, then you can click on Q&A at the bottom of your screen at any time and type, just type your question in and then I'll see them and I'll feed them through to the, uh, to the uh, wonderful poets. Um, before we start, I should probably say that I've only run two live online events before, so please forgive me if this doesn't go quite as smoothly as it could. Um, hopefully we're all here for the poetry, so no one will mind if I fluff up the screen sharing. Um, okay, so that's enough of that. It's time to have some poems. So we're starting with Joe. Joe Dixon is a poet, a critic and an academic based in Nottingham. She completed a PhD in creative writing at NTU in 2018 and now lectures in creative writing at De Montfort University in Leicester. Her poems have appeared in a wide range of anthologies and journals and her debut poetry pamphlet, A Woman in the Queue, was published by Melos Press in May 2016. Uh, in June 2018, she was shortlisted for the Poetry Business 2017-18 International Book and Pamphlet Competition. Her first collection, Pearl, was published by Shoestring Press in July this year. So um, now we'll hand over to Jo and hear some poems, and I'm going to try and share the, uh, share the words of those poems on the screen for you, if I can find the right window. Uh, Thank you, Pippa. It's okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the window with your poems in. That's fine, don't worry. I know it's there somewhere. Aha, just have to scroll down. Okay, go for it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pippa. And uh, hello, everybody. And hello to uh, Maria, too. It's nice to see you there. Um, so, my collection, uh, Pearl, which has just been released uh, by Shoestring Press, um, by uh, David, uh, John Lucas. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to him for supporting it and a big thank you to Pippa and Five Leaves for hosting this event. I'm going to uh, read some poems that are grouped together, really um, connected to the title Pearl. Um, the poems in the collection are grouped around sections of the me different meanings of the word pearl, uh, principally the reason that the meanings of pearl as being a wire or a thread used in, embroid in embroidery, also as a sound of water, a murmuring sound, and also not as commonly used, but in a colloquial sense, um, for things that capsize or are upturned. So Piecework, which is the first poem, is a poem that was inspired by a miniature pair of ballet shoes that my grandmother gave to me. And they were bought from the Freed uh, workshop, which was a very, is a very famous um, manufacturer of ballet shoes. Uh, just one perhaps word in the, the poem, in, I do mention a last, which is the model that the shoemaker would use to, put the, to make the shoes. Piecework. Alongside the portable radio slung from his coat peg, he slips her ballet shoe inside out over the last. Layers burlap, hessian and flower paste glue, fashions blocks to inflame her joints, tear at her tendons. Wax thread joins up at a sole and shavings curl on the concrete as he teases and clips with pliers that sculpt the contours of her feet. In the shank, he presses his emblem. Overnight, the oven sets her blocks, roasts the grain weevils burrowed inside, 
and by lunch next day, a dab of washing up liquid has erased his finger marks, restored her peach satin unbruised. Thank you, Pippa. Uh, the second poem also is related to shoes. Um, perhaps not the threads that are in piecework, but the threads that tie us all together. The neighbor's shoes. We were going on a friend's boat, then she refused. They thought bad of her. She put up with a lot, hid the pain. Take the shoes. You're a school teacher. You must be able to find some use. Three pairs push for space in the carrier. Gray, black, navy. She never knew what she wanted to wear. Come up and see for yourself. In the box room, he's laid out her clothes. By the pillow, dresses, then trousers, jumpers, blouses. Good stuff, she hardly wore. What about this? I hold the cardigan up under my chin to show him it's too big. My daughter won't go through it. At the bottom of the stairs, he talks half an hour more. I'm going home to Scotland. My son says no, but I've bought a new car. He'd been in Aden. Brigade's best sharpshooter. I've heard the stories before. They could be true. I was going home 40 years ago. She kept me here. And I touch his arm. You better get back to the little one. Don't forget your shoes. Thanks, Pippa. The next one was inspired by a visit to the National Memorial Arboretum and it's called Market Garden Way National Memorial Arboretum. And when you glide up, we push at the brims, nudge the berets away from your brows. And when you lean closer for the waltz and our clasped hands tingle and trap the warmth. And when you whisk us round in circles, we grip at Pegasus stitched onto surge. And when you sink again into the Rhine, we fall. 90s ballooning like parachutes and we and when we settle in the riverbed we scatter stickleback eggs across the shingle nothing is impossible reads the Rencom stone where we gather in black coats and stoop where wreaths lean and lie and leaves pearl where the stonemason's carving persists Next poem is simply called Sonnet and perhaps uh, is linked to the idea of Pearl in terms of the murmuring and voices and sound and space. Sonnet. Space or place or void resting on the surface of your mug, sheltering underneath post-it notes, curling away and up from the wall, remembering where, when, who, tucked inside the holes of your watch strap, discarded for now, leaving an answer phone message. Sorry, I can't come. Nestling round and inside a broken eggshell announcing, folding into the meshwork of a dream catcher, absorbing what you want to forget. Calling to your friend across the street, hidden between your pen lid and its clip sending a postcode, postcard home, wish I was there. Thank you, Pippa. The next poem uh, is inspired by a trip on a rib, a rigid inflatable boat. And uh, two images struck me while I was on, on the rib, on the, uh, the River Wye. And, and this is where the poem comes from. Perching at the back of a rib, where damselflies frisk the prow under the bridge. We jerk the strap tight across your life vest and shoulder to shoulder, squeeze in for a photo, mum and dad and son, mama and baba. Fingers picking at his crusted cheeks, at the salt weighing on his lashes, worrying at his wet hoodie, in the channel where the sky presses down. Mama, Baba, Jale, Mum, Dad, Son.
The final poem uh, is, as you can see from the screen, is uh, perhaps might be described as a prose poem. Uh, it's a little bit longer than the others, and I think. I think you should be able to follow it, but the text is a little bit small, perhaps. Perhaps I should have made it a little bit larger. Sorry about that, Pippa. Um, uh, it was inspired by a uh, time in, I spent in South Africa in 2002 on a, a school exchange programme. And uh, it's sort of based on the principle of Ubuntu, which Desmond Tutu describes as you can't be human all by yourself. It also draws on the traditions of the South African praise song. So I shall read this best I can, um, and it will um, go on to a second slide. So uh, I'll try not to stumble over that. There are uh, just a couple of words um, that perhaps I should explain before. I just have to have a quick look at my book. Um, Molo is Ikosa for hello. Nico Nicoli is so I can't pronounce it tonight. Nikosi Sikeli in Africa is the national anthem of South Africa. Uh, I also use um, the clan name of Nelson Mandela, which is Medibe. And Enswele Boa is a person who has failed in Ubuntu. I'll try my best. Apologies for any stumbling on my pronunciation. In praise of Sister Jerome, reading to borders under the Casarina grain quickly, a windbreak of grey-green weeping branch, branchlets, yellow spikes, seeding couples with ruddled heads, cones displayed on her desk at the front. In praise of Mr Condolo sprucing up his shoes on the crease line of his head teacher's suit, enfolding your hands, grabbing your suitcase, Molo, 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 the smooth grey of the airport road fracturing into dust. In praise of his wife at home, a handwritten schedule, day one, and the tablecloth tinged co cobalt blue by her best water jug. In praise of pausing at a whitewashed building with a corrugated roof, mouths shaped by God, waistcoats, hats, collars, capes in white and red, swaying next to the plant pots weaved with sweet paper jewels, lingering at the jam, listening with your skin. In praise of the hall their fathers built, an orchestra of hands, of feet, of thighs, of tongues, girls in blue pinafores, boys in sandy shirts, teenagers slapping gum boots, percussive limbs conjuring grandfathers from the mine, girls with paint, paint petals splashed around their eyes, twirling orange skirts hooped with black braid, verses in Kosa, Zulu, Sesuta, English, Afrikaans, Nikosela, Sikela i Africa, in praise of Medibe at home in Kunu where he grew, watching an armed guard pace the barbed perimeter. He can't see the visitor from England today, slipping a button badge from Wembley 88 back inside your pocket walking past women who'll paint their rooms, wash their curtains, set a price for funeral rent. In praise of Sister Clarence, delivering utensils, pans, two blankets for a boy to tuck round his father. You sit next to her as she revs the engine, forces the wheels over a brick, young men kicking the dust, jeering, pleased with their game. Insuele boyo, sorry, insuele boyo, where is your fur? In praise of the stretch of students following zigzag cracks across the fields, past a pair of goalposts and three rusted cars, saved for uniforms, shirts patched with sweat, ties knotted tight to the top. In praise of harmonies rippling along rows, soaking the soil, latecomers scurrying past Mr. Condlo, arms folded. In praise of the boys revising for an exam that choreographs by multiple choice, junking their desks against the wall, breaking out into the yard, filing back, stooped, stamping, slapping their shins, school ties swinging like chains and feet sweltering in Nike trainers. In praise of an orange skirt hooped with black braid, a coral seed necklace, the rose decorated sign from your classroom door and three letters of thanks. Unpacking your shudder, 
smile, step back, like Proust, dripping a madeleine in his tea. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Pippa. And apologies for all the stumbles. As you said, Pippa, it's the first time live and it's quite nerve-wracking. Yeah, so, just a bit. Just a bit. <laughs> so apologies I'm, for that. <laughs> well, I'm so sorry. I um, skipped the That's fine. earlier than I should have done. That's fine. It's fine. Thank you. But Good thank luck, Maria. Thank you so much. That was really, really wonderful. And I'm sure if everyone thank could you. Up, uh, Oh, there's loads of messages coming through on the chat saying how great it was. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy Maria's fantastic poetry. She's a superstar. OK, so Maria Taylor is amazing. Um, Maria Taylor is a poet and reviewer living in Leicestershire. Uh, her new collection, Dressing for the Afterlife, is published by Nine Arches this month. Uh, in a couple of days, in fact, I think. Um, her pamphlet, Instructions for Making Me, was published by Happenstance in 2016 and her first collection, Melancrini, was also from Nine Arches and came out in 2012. Uh, Melancrini was shortlisted for the Michael Murphy Memorial Prize. She was born in Worksop of Greek Cypriot parents and at the age of six her family moved to London, uh, which is a shame, um, but at least you came back. Uh, after studying at Warwick and Manchester, she became a teacher of English and she's now a lecturer in creative writing. So um, I will hand over to you and hopefully get the screen sharing right for the poems that you're sharing. Okay. Hiya. Can you see me? I'm minimised. So yeah, so um, I can't see me, which is a bit confusing. But if you can see me, then that's okay, right? So you can see me. And here's the book called Dressing for the Afterlife. This is a proof copy, and I should have the real thing quite soon, hopefully. Um, so I'm gonna start off with a poem called Woman Running Alone, uh, uh, not based on anyone who runs and is a woman, I mean. Uh, woman Running Alone. A woman who follows her own trail and pounds pavements of unending cities, past statues of forgotten men, fountains, sticky sunshine pouring over tower blocks, past gentrified basement windows where wives hear the washing up howl between their hands, past suits on phones and panda-eyed women in doorways with faces that say, I know, I know, tell me about it. These streets where open hands beg for more than is ever offered, where someone's kid is a sleeping bag, where the wolf whistle becomes the wolf and loves worn like musk aftershave where she forgets who she is, Miss Keep On, Miss Never Going Home, neither running away nor running toward anyone, wind sifted. Letting the weather sing through her. She who is different to her brothers. The rhythm fills her with flight and her wings, what wings she has. So my next poem is gonna lower the tone. I apologise. Yes, it is the Daniel Craig one for those of you who are familiar with it. So let's just, just go there and just do this. Um, yeah, he likes getting around Daniel Craig. He will be getting around because obviously he's in the book, so um, let him have his fun. Hypothetical. A friend of mine asks me if I'd sleep with Daniel Craig. Before I have time to answer, I'm in bed with Daniel Craig. He's stirring out of sleep, smelling of tobacco vanille. He flatters my performance, asks if I'd like coffee. Hang on, I say, I did not sleep with you, Daniel Craig. This is just a conversational frolic. My friend stands in the corner of my bedroom. You've gone too far, she says. I'm pulling the duvet away from his Hollywood body at exactly the moment my husband enters the room. I say, yes, this is exactly what it looks like, darling. But it's hypothetical, a mere conversational frolic. He's threatening me. There are lawyers in the room. My children begin to cry. I don't even like Daniel Craig. It's too late. The sheets are full of secreted evidence. There are forensics in the room, covering my body in blue powder, checking my skin for fingerprints. They match Daniel Craig's. He doesn't even know he slept with me. My marriage is a dead girl. My neighbours come into the room shaking heads. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. My husband has drawn lists of all the things he wants to keep a plasma screen, an Xbox, a collection of newsly coloured pebbles from our holidays in Truro. When you loved me, 
he snaps, my children will see a therapist after school. Daniel Craig is naked in a hypothetical sense, telling me we can make this work. My friend smirks behind a celebrity magazine featuring lurid details of our affair. There are photos. We are on a beach in the Dominican Republic, healthy and tanned, both kicking sand at a playful Joan Collins. I don't even like Daniel Craig, I tell the scene. So we'll just have to say goodbye to, to Daniel. Um, on, a, on a kind of film note, um, this one is about um, Joan Crawford. Well, it's not about Joan Crawford. I'm imagining an actress a bit like Joan Crawford, who is kind of at the end of her career, who has given up and it is called, and there she was in the shrunken apartment like Joan Crawford, toy dog on her lap. But there's armour in glamour, a mirror's feisty glare of brow and lips, a shield of heavy floral scent, ardour in her gestures, waiting for the non-existent call in stylish torpor on a sterile afternoon. Amen to the small bronze men with 24 carat souls. They prop open doors where joy might cat sneak in. The 20th century invented the microwave for your solitary meals. Pied Russian water in your flask. He knew and improved women read scripts meant for you. A memory of fat cigar smelling fingers, brown trails on your porcelain neck. Ghost of stick with me kid, I'll get you in the movies. Should it ring, let the phone ring. Let it ring. Shut the bedroom door. We'll meditate on diamonds, our best friends. Wear an expensive yoke from Tiffany's. Remember May's words? Hey Bueller, peel me a grape. There isn't any man in the world worth getting lines over. A teardrop pendant sliding over heart or breast, depending on the beholder's eye. So um, this one I think is a shared one. So this is Moon in Gemini. Mm, get in there, get in there. That's all right, it's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll just say to everyone that, of course, as you know, Gemini is the two-headed god thing. Uh, no, not god thing, it's a constellation with two heads. I'm a bit nervous, sorry. Anyway, you know that. Two faces, two heads. Oof, slippy. So this is really meant to be a voice for two, two vo um, a poem even for two voices. But where that slashes, you can imagine someone else reading the next bit. Moon in Gemini. Tonight the moon has two faces, happy, sad. Tonight the moon turns to its other, a twin in glass. Tonight you'll show me constellations of ex-lovers, stolen light. Tonight our eyes won't meet, tonight they will. Tonight you'll think of the past, drown in neon. Tonight a woman in a mirror says, go home, don't listen. Tonight be drunk and very wise, read misguided. Tonight you'll seek the moon, don't trust the brag. Tonight someone will love, will hate. Tonight the moon is frail, is strong. Okay, so... Um, I'm just going to minimize, right, so the next one is learning to love in Greek. So this is a bit of a Greek lesson for people. Uh, as good old ancient Greeks had loads, and oh, modern Greeks for that matter, she says, I've got lots of words for love because you don't love cucumbers, I guess, the same way you love your beloved partner. Or maybe some of you do, but we won't go there. So a um, bit of a whistle stop. Learning to love in Greek. They said, beware eros, though many begin with madness. Learn to fall in love with dancing. This is ludic, the love you felt for skipping ropes or bikes. If eros and ludus combine, you may suffer mania, the white blood of the moon that petrifies. Grow philia, the love of football fans on terraces. Chant together, fight with the same heart. If you have children or a puppy, you'll know storyi. It rhymes with be. It sits at kitchen tables, magnetizing its crayon drawings to fridges. If you don't have these, you may feel story from an old aunt, a mate. A lover might see the child hiding in you from a cowlick of grey that won't be brushed straight. Then philafdia, loving the self. Not so easy for others who dive into pools of themselves. Too easy for your own best friend. When love moves into a house with a mortgage and enough space for the future, this is Brahma. To stand in love comes after falling. Pray you'll land on your feet. Above all, Arabi, 
when you forget who you are and take someone's hand. Um, the next one is, then I reconsidered prayer. And there really is an icon um, in my family village in Cyprus where, the, I'm sorry, the saint looks exactly like Frank O'Hara. I've got a photo of it somewhere. One day I'll show everyone. Then I reconsidered prayer. It was unlike me, light years since my Giria Leison or the cross performed three digits over school stomach and shoulders. In summer, I went back to the chapel in my father's austere village, thinking it was ironic that St. Minas resembled Frank O'Hara so perfectly. I lit Frank a candle and prayed at an altar of two-headed golden eagles to Our Lady of Infinite Hangovers, to the patron saint of Citalopram and the holy trinity of vodka, aging and insomnia. When the young priest entered, he was so kind that I almost thought it was okay to be me. If I kept quiet, I could be part of the stone. Once a drunk in a dingy Soho pub mistook the moon I keep on a silver chain around my neck for St. Christopher, I told God about it. I lit another flame for those who journey alone, for the penitent and for the lost. So the next one is another one of those on-screen jobbos. So I'm going to just maximize. Yeah, okay, so this is a game. So, okay, this is gonna be different to your uh, normal poetry reading. Um, if you ever played Choose Your Own Adventure, if you remember that from back in the day, 80s, 90s, where you have to turn the page and it tells you where you're going in your adventure. So I'm afraid I'm in control of your adventure and you are a woman and this is you okay so this is choose your own, advent choose your own adventure for grown-ups so every time i say turn to 13 if you imagine that you have to turn the page to 13 so let's play along choose your own adventure one on your search for the gray third mountain gorillas you come across the orc throw at the dice your throw is impressive cast him from the high ledge so he falls to his doom cock him a snook you have no choice but to return home. Turn to 13. 13. Your family squabbles over stew. They have the eloquence of swifts. No one cares about how you defeated the orc. It is the same life lived every day. Father reminds you that your brothers and sisters were married at your age with proper jobs. You can't even find a grey furred mountain gorilla. To faint a headache and go to your room, turn to 25. To go out for the night, Turn to 75. 75. In the inn of the monopods, you choose a double vodka shot. Skilla buys the rounds. She blows poison in the men's ears. You drink and drink from the vile chalice that replenishes itself. Drink and drink until you throw up. Charybdis holds back your hair. A true friend, if only to dance floor, would stay still. To go home in a taxi, turn to 40 to seek the elegant stranger who'll take you to Zizi's and save you from this mess, turn to 37. 37, he's married, go to 40. 40, you wake up by the river of daggers, were guests and goblinoids lick your face. The water tastes of dejection. The orcs, orcish solicitor has posted you a letter written in the strongest terms. To pull the covers over your head, go to 25, that's it. There's no other option. 25, you dream. The wise wear rat pulls out the cards. Out of only three possible endings, you may choose only one. The high priestess of speed dating, the page of sorrow, the magician reversed. And um, finally, um, this is my final poem of the night which is, well, when I wrote it, I didn't realize we we're gonna have a global pandemic, but that's what happens. Um, it's actually an a unrhymed sonnet, I believe. So when we were coming up to the 2020s, I thought, oh, it'd be like, like flapper girls, 2020s, we'll all have fun. Uh, didn't quite happen, right? So anyway, this is an alternative 2020. I began the 2020s as a silent film goddess. On the 1st of January, I threw away my smartphone and wrote a letter to my bow in swirling ink. I bobbed my hair, wore a cloche hat and shimmied right into town for juleps. 
I became Clara, I became Louise. When I became a vamp, the boys fell dead at my feet. I threw petals over their heads. I dined on prosperity sandwiches and sidecars, leaving restaurants with a sugar-rimmed mouth. In summer, I was a night-blooming flower. By autumn, I was a hangover. Winter made me a Wall Street crash. Talking pictures were my ruin. At last, I had a voice, but no one wanted to hear. Forgotten sisters, oh Vilma, oh Nora, oh May, a musty headdress of peacock feathers, defiant silence. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. And now I can. Oh, thank you so much, Maria. That was amazing. Um, I was desperately trying not to laugh out loud because I noticed I wasn't muted and uh, thought if I was cackling over the top of it, that would oh. be very good. Yeah, I um, I couldn't see myself at all, so I was really just talking to a little light in the middle of my screen, uh, um, was, apart from when the ones shared on screen. So yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much, and thank you, Joe, and yeah, yeah. Just have a glass of water now. I think so. Well, thank you ever so much mm. to both of you. Um, we've got maybe five or ten minutes if anyone in the audience has any questions they want to ask um, either or both of the poets. Um, I've got a couple of spare ones uh, just in case everyone's um, quiet. Um, I did actually want to ask you, Maria, if you've recovered mm. enough. Um, your Choose Your Own Adventure poem is yeah. definitely an adventure in form um yeah and you've also That's done fun. you've yeah. also done the poetry bingo i think mm. dance wasn't it um yeah yeah i like yeah i do like messing around with form when i can um they don't come to me as much as like the sort of normal sort of inverses poems but when they come they're fun and i just get on with it and just like them so yeah it yeah it's one of those things. I wish they'd come a bit more often. That would be so nice. Yeah. I mean, not everyone likes stuff like that. I mean, I remember someone saying, oh, "That was. why did you write that? That was very... But, you know, here you are. <laughs> yeah, it's a different way of yeah. um, expressing the idea, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, David Belbin said in the chat that... Uh, he, he uh, he's asked, were you a fan of those choose your own adventures or was it just a, a form that you decided to use? I did really like them. They were like a really massive craze when we were kids. Like no one actually used the dice. No one bothered with that. It was just, you just sit there with the book and it was just a different way of reading. Like you would turn the pages just mm. according to the numbers. Maybe that's why I like poetry because you don't have to read it from left to right. You can kind of dive in and out. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, true. this is true. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Linda Clark for Joe. Um, <laughs> did the idea of Pearl inspire some of the poems or did the name arise after writing them? Ah, good question. Uh, thank you, Linda. Hello, up there in Scotland. Uh, hope you're okay. Um, the title sort of came afterwards. Um, I had all the poems and uh, it came, the word, the, the word Pearl comes from the poem Market Garden Way. And it is a word that um, I find, I just found it was uh, resonating with all the poems. And, and as Maria and, and people know, when you're trying to get your poems together into a collection and organize them, um, you don't, I didn't write with Pearl to begin with. Pearl came as an, org, as sort of a, as a structure afterwards. Um, but it is, it is quite difficult when you're set, when you're asked, well, what are you going to call your collection? Uh, how are you going to organize it? Which order are you going to put all the poems in? And, and the word Pearl just, uh, was resonating through all the poems, really, uh, the different meanings of the words. So that's how it came about. And um, Maria, how did you come about, come up with your title? Um, completely by accident. See, Joe sounds like such a good idea. Like, you know, I don't know. Did you, did you kind of do that before or after? Or did you notice a pattern sort of? I think when, it's when, I had them, when I had them all laid out on the floor and I was yeah. trying to organise them yeah. um, and moving them around and reading them next to each other. Mm -hmm. and, and that word pearl was just resonating and it just oh, sort of popped out as the word that was linking them all together yeah 
I mean, for my, for my book, um, we just, I think, I'm, I've been lucky, I've had editors who have helped me sort of noticed a blindingly obvious. <laughs> so I was lucky with the happenstance collection and with dressing for the afterlife. It was just one of those little phrases. It actually was the title of a poem that I junked and um, I didn't want it in the collection. And Jane said, yeah, the title's nice though. So we used it as a title for the whole collection, which um, after that, I finally knew what I was doing and I haven't had a full collection since 2012, so it wasn't until last year that I finally knew what I was doing. So if I ever do write book free, I hope it doesn't take me seven years to figure it out. That was a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's too long as far as your, uh, your fans are concerned. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, so we've got a question from Cathy Bell. Um, uh, hi, Cathy. Hi, Cathy. Hello, Cathy. <laughs> hi. And David, apparently. Um, hi, who, who happens to know, um, my goodness knows how, that you both teach hi. writing poetry and have also attended workshops and such mm -hmm. like. How does mm -hmm. teaching or learning about your craft feed into your own creative practices? Um, jo, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. That was David or Cathy or both of them? It was, probably both yeah. of them. I probably yeah, yeah. Both them. Um, I think uh, teaching it, 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 when I'm teaching creative writing, I'm often, uh, we're, we're teaching students different interests. They want to write in lots of different forms. They have different ways of working. And I think it pushes you out of your comfort zone. You start thinking about doing different things. Um, your students sort of inspire you to, to come out of your comfort zone. So um, I think that's, that's how it feeds into my work is trying new things, trying different forms that, you know, they enjoy, uh, they enjoy ex experimenting with. So I think that's for me what happens. Mm. Maria, how about you? Um, it's really odd for me because I need, obviously I do a lot of teaching, but I need a lot of, it, I kind of need gaps afterwards to sort of breathe and then kind of work through some of the ideas that I've just been talking about. So um, it, it's funny, I tend to write, um, I suppose we teach more poetry in the autumn. <laughs> <laughs> so I tend to be more poetic in the autumn and then I've got this weird feeling like in the summer that I want to start writing prose all of a sudden and then it kind of goes away again. Um, I, I, I don't know really. I, I just find that they can work very well together as long as they both have um, a bit of breathing space as well. And uh, my own writing has a bit of space around it. And I couldn't just, you know, just teach and then like the next day just suddenly I, I need to kind of switch off a bit from it as well. Yeah, <laughs> different ways of thinking, isn't it? Um, yeah. Using yeah. your creativity in different ways. Mm -hmm. So switching from one to the other mm -hmm. isn't necessarily that easy. Yeah, I, I remember Mary Oliver saying that, you know, she's quite famous and all that. And she said that she had to give up teaching because she thought that she wouldn't write anymore which is like quite an extreme thing, but you can understand that, you know, when you've got both of those things that, you know, mm. Mm. and so other people that. thrive off it, of course, other people, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we've got time for another question. Um, so this one's from Siob Siobhan Logan. Um, did you both have Siobhan. much editorial input from your publishers in refining the collections? Um, who wants to go first? Um, I, I'll go first, yes. Okay. Hello. Um, they don't tamper with the poems themselves other than have you thought about putting a comma here or something like that. Um, but they're quite good at helping me, to, as I said, to see the absolute obvious. So especially with titling that I, for the actual collections, you know, you know, like Nell Nelson just took a line out of one of the poems and said, instructions for making me. And I was like, oh, that's actually my line anyway. And it, it doesn't 
so I need I need sometimes I need editors to kind of help me see things really that I don't always see um, but Jane is a really really great editor she takes time she takes the manuscript away I thought she didn't want it I thought oh no this is it I'm not going to have a book but she spent quite a lot of time just kind of sitting with it and thinking about ordering and stuff like that um, so yeah the editors are really are worth their weight in gold because good, mm. good ones will, will certainly say, when you find good ones absolutely. yeah yeah and they kind of help you out um but you know it, it went well i was lucky yeah good how, how about you joe yes a uh, very similar experience to maria i had an excellent editor in john lucas who, like Jane, takes great care over your poems. Um, and as Maria said, doesn't really change, isn't changing the poems themselves, but just the odd punctuation uh, mark here and there, uh, the odd word here and there maybe. But what John was really good with me, because obviously it's my first collection, so it was my first, my first go at it, I suppose, having that editorial relationship. Um, he was good at pointing out the, the poems that he thought were really strong. And I hadn't, as Maria says, you don't see it because you're too close to it all the time. So they give you that distance to see your work slightly differently. Uh, and there were a couple of poems that got lost along the way. Um, and I'd put them in knowing that they weren't quite, quite ready or quite right for the collection. Uh, and John just said, no, Joe, that's not. <laughs> he just he just gives you that confidence. He just confirmed confirmed it really. So so it's a very it, when you get a good editor, editor, it's really it was a really positive experience for me, and it made the collection much stronger. I think because of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did um did he have much input in the ordering of the poems, or was that mainly your decision? Um, I no, the order was my decision. Yeah, the ordering uh, of this collection was was my decision. Mm. We didn't change the order at all. We all ditched right. a couple yeah. of poems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you both ever so much. I think um, we're probably getting to the end of the event now, which is quite sad as far as I'm concerned. It's been lovely. Um, I think everyone will agree that you both gave wonderful readings. I certainly think so, and. Um, to the audience i hope you're all going to rush to buy their new collections from five leaves of course um <laughs> if you haven't got them already i mean you won't have maria's already yet but uh, you can pre-order it from us we will be getting copies in um as an incentive to buy from us we're offering a 10 percent discount on any book or pamphlet by either of the poets until the end of october so um please <laughs> go, go in, go in and buy. Ross is feeling lonely. Actually, Ross is on holiday at the moment, so um, <laughs> feeling even more lonely. Bless him. Um, yeah. Or so either go into the shop, or you can email an order to bookshop at fiveleaves.co.uk. Um, and finally, just to finish, um, thank you so much to Joe and Maria for sharing their poetry with us, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Yeah. Now Thanks, I'll everyone. Well done, Joe. Yes, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Pippa. Thanks for all the comments in the chat. I haven't been able to read them all yet, but yeah, thank you very yeah. much, everybody, for those comments. They're really, it's really nice to see them. Thank you. And thanks, oh, Pippa. Thanks, everybody. And thank, thank you, Maria. You. Right.